Thanks for that reading, Sanjahi. Um, let me add my welcome to Simon's. My name's Rod. If you're new or visiting, I'm one of the pastors here at Wollongong Baps. It's great to have you with us. Um, I'd like to get to know you too over uh, morning tea afterwards, so please do stay around. Um, as we look at the end um, section of this big series we've been doing in Genesis 1 to 50, we're, we're looking at 14 chapters in one block. So there's a lot to cover, and the outline on the back may be more than useful this morning. Uh, for that reason, so uh, just making you aware that that's there. Um, we'll be concluding, obviously, today our Term 2 series. The next couple of weeks we'll have a couple of one-off um, talks, and then we'll be starting a new series in Term 3 in three weeks' time. So just letting you know where we're going. Um, in a couple of weeks' time we'll have Cameron Eccleston here from Baptist World Aid um, sharing some of their work and speaking that morning. Um, let me note too that we're still uh, continuing to look for um, children. So there are 100 children on the Sunday school roll and we're looking for some more teachers for this next term. Um, so you may be tired at the end of this term and thinking about serving next term is the last thing on your mind at the moment. But let me encourage you in a few days, if you get to slow down a little, uh, to consider that and speak to myself or Joy or someone else involved in teaching. We'd really love to know about your involvement next term if you can help. Well, let me pray for us now as we come uh, to this passage together. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for uh, the freedom to meet here together, for the joy of being in Christ if we've placed our faith in him, and for the way we can be built up as we hear your voice through your word, which is living and active. Uh, we thank you that your spirit applies it to our hearts and minds, uh, convicts us, encourages us, so we ask again this morning that you might be at work in us, each one, as we hear your word, that we might respond with faith and action. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the most tragic event to befall the American military since the Vietnam War happened on October 23, 1983. Uh, it was the Sunday morning terrorist bombing of the Marine Barracks in Beirut in which a truck loaded with explosives was detonated right outside their compound. 241 soldiers died and 128 were wounded as they slept. And the scenes that followed, of course, were chaotic and tragic as um, those survivors tried to pull themselves from under the rubble and look out for their fellow soldiers who were still trapped underneath. Several days after the tragedy, uh, the commander of this Marine Corps visited some of the survivors that had been flown uh, to Germany uh, for treatment in a hospital there. And as he came along this ward visiting several of them, he reached a man named Corporal Jeffrey Nashton, who'd been badly wounded in the explosions. Uh, people said at the time that he looked more machine than man. He had so many um, lines coming out of him. Um, and racked with pain, unable to move very well, he motioned that the commander might give him a piece of paper and a pen, and he wrote a short note to him and handed it to him. And on the piece of paper were but two words, Semper Fi, the Latin motto of the Marines, forever faithful. Big statement at that moment, isn't it? I think sometimes we're really impressed by the stories of men and women who are faithful to their promises no matter the cost that they bring. But they pale into insignificance in comparisons to God's promise keeping, which just continues generation after generation after generation. And we'll see this morning that promises that were made way back to Abraham in Genesis 12 continue to flow on through Jacob and his sons as they head toward Egypt. And I think as we consider these um, themes, we're aware that God sovereignly fulfills his plans, even despite the ups and downs and the events that happen, even in an individual's life, as we'll see in Joseph's life this morning, that despite the problems he went through, God was fulfilling his purposes. He would see to it. And I think at those times, um, this relates to ourselves, we can think that God has forgotten us or wonder if he knows what he's doing. I'm sure Joseph did as he was languishing in jail for two years at one point. We might be think, tempted to think that God is not in control. And that's the big question I want us to consider today. Why is God still in control even when things are hard? 
Why is God still in control even when things are hard or when things go wrong? And that brings me to the first point on your outline. Point one, because he knows what will unfold. Point one, he knows what will unfold. Notice again what was um, read for us in verses 2 to 7 of Genesis 37 as we see the start of the account of Joseph's life. This is the account of Jacob's family line. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, and he brought their father a bad report about them. Now, Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in his old age. And he made an ornate robe for him. When his brothers saw that their father loved him more than any of them, they hated him and they could not say a kind word to him. Joseph had a dream and when he told it to his brothers, they hated him all the more. He said to them, listen to this dream I had. We were binding sheaves of grain out in the field when suddenly my sheaf rose up and stood upright while your sheaves all gathered around mine and bowed down to it. Well, it's an interesting start, isn't it, to Joseph's life here, as it's recorded for us. Joseph is the second youngest son of his father, Jacob. The youngest is actually Benjamin, whose birth was marked by the tragedy of his mother, Rachel, dying. Verse 3 tells us that Jacob, or Israel as he'd been renamed, loved Joseph more than all the others. And we're told he loved Joseph because he was born in his old age. It's worth noting, therefore, um, Benjamin was born in his even older age. But the reason that both Joseph and Benjamin are singled out and loved more by their father is that they're born to his favorite wife, Rachel. That's the core of the favoritism and the problems within the family at this point. Recall that uh, Laban, Jacob's uncle, tricked him into marrying Rachel's older sister, Leah. And then Leah and Rachel um, got into an arms race, as it were, um, about how many children they could give Jacob. And they then married off their maidservants, Bilhah and Zilpah, to him so that he ends up with four wives and, of course, 12 sons. And this favoritism, which had plagued the family for two generations already, continued. Remember, Abraham and Sarah were to favor Isaac, the chosen one, over the eldest Ishmael. Then Isaac had favored, having seen that in his own life, his older son Esau over Jacob, even though God had said Jacob would be the one through whom the chosen line would continue. And here again, we have Jacob doing the same thing. And so now Joseph's brothers, well, they resent him. They resent him being the father's favorite. And this leads to this point of hatred that we read about. But even so, um, there's no sense in which they're going to murder him initially. It seems that the dreams that he has and then insists on telling them is really the tipping point uh, for the relationship. Uh, The boiling point is reached and plans for his murder are made after two dreams that Joseph shared with them about how they bow down to him. Now, these two dreams are the the first of three pairs of dreams in this whole section of Genesis 37 to 50. Have the two dreams of Joseph. Then there's the dream of the two servants of Pharaoh, uh, the cupbearer and the baker. And then there are two dreams to Pharaoh himself. And those latter two pairs, Joseph himself will interpret with God's help. But in these first two, Joseph is the teller rather rather than the interpreter. Unlike Pharaoh's later two dreams, which are said to be one and the same, both Joseph's dreams are making the same point, that his family will come to bow down to him. And it's suggested too by the complementarity of the dreams. Notice that one is set on earth and it's got the sheaves reaping in the fields, the other set in heaven, the sun, moon and stars, but both are establishing that God will definitely do this, that God will fulfill his word. This is his um, foretelling of the future. I guess the family didn't know that, though. Um, Certainly the brothers did not take it as God's word about the future. They just saw it as part of Joseph's inflated ego and wanting to be important before them. 
And so it just added to their hatred of him to this tipping point where they desired to kill him. But as much as his brothers despised Joseph the dreamer, God really had revealed the future through these dreams. This really was what would happen. God's plans would be fulfilled. And due to a seven-year famine, Joseph's brothers would make two trips to Egypt later in search of grain. And of course, at that point, unbeknownst to them, Joseph, who they'd sold into slavery, had been raised to second in the kingdom under Pharaoh, was in charge of all the grain of the kingdom that he'd been storing to protect against this seven years of famine. And there they come before him begging for food, bowing down before him. The first trip in chapter 42 has 10 of the brothers. Um, Jacob, the father, now is all the more concerned for Benjamin, the only son he loves who is left because Joseph, it seems, has been killed. So Benjamin is kept with his father and the rest are sent to get grain. Of course, Joseph sees to it that when they come back again, they're not to return without Benjamin. And so the second time in chapter 43, Benjamin is there as well. And we get the account of what happened in fulfillment of God's plans in chapter 42, verses 3 to 9. Then ten of Joseph's brothers went down to buy grain from Egypt. But Jacob did not send Benjamin, Joseph's brother, with the others because he was afraid that harm might come to him. Now Joseph was the governor of the land, the person who sold grain to all its people. So when Joseph's brothers arrived, they bowed down to him with their faces to the ground. Verse 9, then Joseph remembered his dreams about them. God's word fulfilled, just as he said. The same scenario, as I mentioned, follows in the next chapter, a couple of years later, when they return this time with Benjamin. And we read in chapter 43 from verse 26, when Joseph came home, They presented to him, that is the brothers, the gifts they had brought into the house and they bowed down before him to the ground. Verse 28, they replied, your servant, our father, is still alive and well. And they bowed down, prostrating themselves before him. Now, a lot has happened in between these two events. Uh, The dreams that Joseph had as a 17-year-old and hear him as the ruler of all Egypt under Pharaoh with his brothers bowing down to him. Lots of ups and downs between. Joseph had suffered at the hands of his brothers. They'd sold him into slavery to Midianites who had then sold him to Potiphar in Egypt. He'd worked there and worked his way up, but then had been imprisoned after being falsely accused. He is forgotten after he correctly interprets the dream of the cupbearer who promises to mention him before Pharaoh. He doesn't. And two years later, we have this beautiful line where he says to Pharaoh, as he's struggling with a dream he's just had, I'm reminded of my shortcomings, <laughs> that I've forgotten about this guy, Joseph, for two years. He's brought before, of course, tells the dreams, and suddenly he's second in command. Such suffering amidst um, God's plan here, as he rises to prominence. And yet God has been at work in all of this to perfectly fulfill his word. He really does know the future. And he will see to it that it unfolds that way. Which brings me to those two dreams of Pharaoh. Um, He had interpreted the cupbearer and the the baker's dreams incorrectly. He's brought before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh has these two dreams about the skinny and the fat cows, about the small heads of grain and the the large heads of grain, the skinny ones eating uh, the well-fed And Joseph correctly interprets, as God helps him, that they'll have seven years of plenty, but that'll be followed by seven years of famine. They need to store up in the good times so that they might have food in the bad. It's exactly what will unfold. Pharaoh recognizes his authoritative interpretation of his dream, puts him in command, makes him the person that will see to it that they survive the famine. And the famine, of course, unfolds exactly as God had said. Both times through these dreams, God is revealing perfectly his the future. He knows what will unfold. No matter the suffering, the difficulties, the ups and downs that individuals will face as those things take place. And the application from ourselves from this first point is that we have to trust God because he does know the future. Indeed, we've got no other choice. He is the only one who knows the future. 
We don't. We struggle blindly, wondering what's around the next corner. And yet the God of the universe has mapped out exactly what will occur. And he will see to it that it unfolds. Our lives really are in, our, in his hands. In 2002, um, my wife Christine and I were expecting our first child. Uh, the years of just studying at Bible college had finished. Uh, we had just moved to Chatswood and we were excited about starting a family. We were so pleased that God had blessed us with a child. We'd been married for about six years at that point. And uh, we, it was all we could do to wait until um, she was 12 weeks pregnant to, to ring all of our family and tell them the exciting news and friends as well that we were expecting in September of that year, 2002. Uh, we had just finished ringing everyone and talking about it when about a week later, at almost 13 weeks, um, Christine miscarried. Now at that point, we saw no reason uh, why God had done that. Why was this happening? Uh, we were deeply saddened at the time. We had the difficult task of then ringing all the people that we'd just rung to tell them we were no longer expecting and that this was our situation. Now, of course, we're not alone in facing that situation that year or any other year. Our sorrow was by no means unique. You know, 70,000 babies are lost to stillbirth or miscarriage every single year in Australia. One in four pregnancies end that way. But we were really struggling with it at the time. We wondered what was God doing. Didn't he have good plans for us? But we needed to trust him. We needed to know that he did know best and that he was a loving God and did indeed have wonderful plans for us. In hindsight, we were struck more clearly with the miracle of life when our, our eldest, now Harrison, was born some 12 months later. We were just so thankful to God for his provision at that point. But you see, God knew all of that before any of it had happened. In Psalm 139, uh, David can affirm that God knows and determines every single day of our life before we're even born. Verse 16, David writes, Your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So I want to encourage you this morning that we can trust God. He does know what will happen and he always has the future in his hands. We don't. And so we're called to trust him as his dependent children, knowing that he has good plans for those who love him. And that brings me to a second point. Point two on your outline. Why can we trust God when things go wrong? Because he uses events to fulfill his purposes. He uses events to fulfill his purposes. Notice what is recorded in Genesis 45, verses 4 to 8. Then Joseph said to his brothers, Come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then it was not you who sent me here, but God. Amazing words. I mean, Joseph's revealing his identity here to his brothers. It's really the climactic moment of their trips back and forth to Egypt. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, not all of them came the first time. Benjamin does come the second time at Joseph's insistence and at his father's great reluctance to let him go. But they're all there at this point as Joseph reveals himself. Joseph has just tested them again and has said, well, look, he'll keep Benjamin with him and the rest of them can go home with the grain the second time. And Judah, the fourth child, makes an impassioned speech and says, look, you can't do that. You know, dad's going to die if Benjamin doesn't return. He's already left, lost Joseph. You know, let me be your slave. I'll stay and do whatever you like. Just let Benjamin go home. 
And it's at that climactic moment that Joseph reveals himself. He's overcome with emotion himself and says, look, I am your brother. And then says those amazing words about it being God's plan, overruling this all along, not to be worried about their desire to harm him and to send him to Egypt. Well, they're shocked at the revelation. They're amazed that he has no plans for revenge. They really can't believe that. But did you notice four times in those verses in chapter 45, he makes the point again and again in case they're missing it. God sent me to Egypt. It wasn't your scheming. This is God's plan, not yours. Don't worry. Not only does God know what will unfold because he determines the future, God will also work events to fulfill his purposes perfectly. Even the sinfulness of humans cannot thwart his plans. He will simply use it for his perfect plans and purposes in any case. His plans are never thwarted. And so God's providence is always at work, uh, even in the darkest deeds of humanity. He works for good. You know, it's got to be the ultimate example of divine overruling. An imprisoned slave from a nothing area being called to interpret the dream of the king of the superpower of the day and then put in control of his kingdom. Impossible. Could never happen. Except that God planned it. And so, of course, it was definitely going to happen. And that's how Joseph understood it. Joseph again summarized his understanding of God's work in his life despite all the suffering he faced shortly after his father died. The other brothers are still worried. Or maybe Joseph's just being kind because dad's still alive. But once dad dies, that'll be it. Revenge is really on. And so they come to him pleading after Jacob's death saying, really, what are you going to do? And Joseph says to them again in Genesis 50 verse 19, don't be afraid. Am I in the place of God? You intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. Well, you know, God does this over and over and over again in history. Many of you will know of the tragic deaths of um, Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, Pete Fleming, Ed McCulley and Roger Uterin, who went as five missionaries to bring the gospel to the hostile Orca Indian tribe in Ecuador in the 1950s. Uh, they went there in 1955, uh, started dropping pamphlets and food supplies, uh, seeking contact with the tribe before landing on the ground and wanting to share the gospel with them. And they commenced on the ground in January uh, 3, 1956, uh, went to them to share the good news of Jesus, and they were all speared to death. All of them were married. All but one of them had young children. Jim Elliott had a 10-month-old daughter, Valerie, with Elizabeth. Uh, Nate and Marjorie Saint had three children, Kathy, Steve, and Philip. Ed and had two sons, Steve and Mike, and his wife, Mary Lou, was eight months pregnant with their third son, Matthew. Roger was married to Barbara, and they had two children, Beth and Jerry. Pete Fleming was married to Olive, and shortly before Fleming's death, she had had her second miscarriage. Now, lots of people said, oh, what is God doing? And these are godly people. They've planned years in advance for this moment. They're wanting to do God's will and share the gospel. Surely God's made a mistake, or maybe he's really not in control here. Such a heartbreaking tragedy might understandably test the faith of their wives and their children, let alone their commitment to that particular mission. But, you know, to the surprise of many, the effort to reach the Orca Indians was not abandoned by those families. Now, Rachel Saint, uh, Nate's sister, who was working with Whitcliffe at the time, um, his older sister, she was passionate about taking the gospel to unreached tribes. And she decided that she would especially want to reach the Orcas now, translate the scriptures into their own languages. Elizabeth Elliot, Jim's wife, returned to a nearby tribe with her young daughter, Valerie, and between the two of them, they made contact with two Orca women in Ecuador. In 1958, Rachel returned to the tribe, and this led to Rachel and Elizabeth being invited to live with them. 
And so they experienced firsthand, you know, the orca lifestyle. They perfected their language. Amazing things flowed from that. The Gospel of Mark was published in the orca language just a few years later. The eventual pastor of the tribe, Chemo, uh, who was also one of the killers, had the opportunity to baptise Steve and Kathy St. Nate's children. He killed their father. He baptised the children. Ed's wife, Mary Lou, returned to Ecuador. She lived in Quito for six years, running a home for missionary children. Nate's sister, Rachel, lived with the Orca tribe for the rest of her life. She died and was buried there among them. So let me ask you, the tragic death of these five men, what was God's purpose in this? Well, it was the saving of many lives through the gospel being preached. God fulfilled his gospel purposes in spite of and through the suffering that occurred. God is always at work for his purposes to bring many people to himself through his son the lord jesus if we needed any convincing of the way god works in such mysterious methods and then we would only need to look to our savior himself to look at the son and see what happened now as we think through the fulfilling of god's purposes in genesis 37 to 50 i think one thing we have to be drawn to is the prophecies made by Jacob, or Israel as he'd been renamed, to all his sons in Genesis 49. Genesis 49 is an amazing chapter where God outlines the future, centuries ahead, all the way to Christ, through the words of the father to his sons. And so in verses 8 to 12, I'd like you to turn there if you've got your Bibles with you. Um, Genesis 49, verses 8 to 12, we see the blessing that Jacob gives to Judah. And I think verses 8 to 10 highlight the fierce um, dominance of the tribe of Judah within Israel. It's clear that the scepter will not be taken away from them. That is, they will be the ruling tribe, the line of kings for the nation of Israel. Judah, the fourth-born son, not the eldest again. Judah, the one who thought it'd be good to make money out of Joseph going to Egypt, let's sell him, we at least make some money out of this. Judah will be the line, and from him the kings will come. The scepter will not depart from Judah, verse 10. And we know that this was true. They became the line of kings. The rule of the country was from Jerusalem in the south, in the tribe of Judah. But however, notice the second part of verse 10. It should raise even more eyebrows for us. The phrase, until he comes to whom it belongs. Who is this king in the line of Judah who will eventually come to whom the scepter belongs? Well, it's a veiled reference to Jesus who would descend from the tribe of Judah and be the king of kings, the one who would have an eternal kingdom, replace the limited earthly kingdoms of these kings of Judah. This ruler would be so great, notice in verse 10, that he will receive the obedience of the nations. Well, look, even at the height of David and King Solomon, they, they ruled half a dozen nations around them. But not the obedience of all the nations in verse 10. And this promise would be fleshed out to King David in 2 Samuel 7 verse 16. In 2 Samuel 7 verse 16, God would say to David, Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Well, that's not possible because all of the kings, well, they live, they live 70 or 80 years. They may be ruled for 40 at the most like David. How can they rule forever? Well, those words were taken up, of course, in Luke chapter 1 before the birth of Jesus where Mary is told by the angel Gabriel in verses 32 and 33, Your son Jesus will be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. And so the fulfillment of Genesis 49 comes in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus, the great, 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 great grandson of Judah. Amazing. God works his purposes through all the mess and chaos of history, 
through those that are chosen for that line, that you would think he would choose somebody else. Judah, uh, the accountant who sold him his brother off for money, will be the line. And as we apply this final point, we need to see that God is always working things for good for those who love him. Indeed, Jesus is the ultimate example of this. As we look at his life, all we see is the scheming and sinfulness of mankind that sees him falsely arrested, falsely charged, falsely condemned, and then crucified on a cross by a crowd baying for his blood who did not appreciate that he was the only one ever who was undeserving of death, the innocent one that they were killing who had come to die even for them. Well, the Apostle Peter puts it this way as he preached boldly to the crowds in Jerusalem at Pentecost shortly after. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was accredited by God to you through miracles, wonders and signs, which God did amongst you as you well know. This man was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge and you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. God at work, working out his sovereign purposes, even in his son. It must have seemed like all had been lost at the point Jesus died on the cross. His followers were giving up. They're walking aimlessly down the road to Emmaus. They've run away in fear. They're hiding in rooms. The devil must have thought he'd had a great victory that day. And yet it was all part of God's plan and foreknowledge that he would allow his son to bear the sin of the world and then be raised on the third day. And what that means for you and I is that God's fulfillment of his purposes brings meaning to our suffering too. There wasn't just meaning to Christ's suffering. There's meaning to yours to the trials that we face day by day. The Apostle Peter could later write it this way in 1 Peter 1, as he wrote to people suffering, being persecuted for their faith. Now for a little while, you may have had to suffer grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith may result in praise, glory and honour when Jesus Christ is revealed. Do you have that perspective, God's perspective on our world and even the small events of our individual lives? Our response has to be to trust God with our lives. There's no one else to turn to. There's no one else we can place our trust in, certainly not ourselves. And God was faithful generation after generation for the Israelites because of his unchanging promises first made to Abraham. He will continue to be faithful. They repeated to Isaac and then to Jacob and then to Joseph and his other children. I asked at the start, why can we say that God is still in control when things go wrong? Well, I think we can see from Genesis 37 to 50, the answer is twofold. One, because God determines the future. He knows the future. Secondly, God uses all the ups and downs, all the messes of this world to fulfill his perfect purposes. And nothing can thwart that. He truly is in charge. We can experience God's ongoing faithfulness too if we can continue to trust in him with our lives, recognizing that he truly is in control. Please don't doubt it that God knows what he's doing. God's still on the throne and he always will be. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we look out at our world and are sometimes lost in the chaos of all the events and tragedies and suffering and disappointments that we see, Amidst too many joys and wonderful things that we see in your creation around us. But we're struck by the problems and difficulties, uh, the, the lack of purpose that often brings to people's minds about what is unfolding in their life. But Lord, we know that you are truly in charge.
you have a track record that's demonstrated it century after century after century. Help us not think that our lives are too small or of no interest that you have not planned them to. Indeed, all the days of our lives were written in your book before one came to be. Lord, help us to have that outlook, to truly give our lives over to you, knowing that you are worthy of our trust and that you will work for good for those who love you. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen.